yo, what's up? Cootie Mayo, keep it steady, yo. I hope you're keeping it steady. So this video, we're gonna go totally different. Something I've been wanting to get into, I just had to make you stop spinning first, so. Now we're gonna look at um, his, his historical facts here and record. You know, what's been documented, what's been uh, drawn, what's been talked about in books and discussions and different records from the past, all right? And this is in regards to the Aboriginal native tribes that were in the Americas. And I'm talking about North, Central, and South, right? So I'm talking about the couple colored native tribes that were here. And I'm gonna connect this. And I hope you can take this journey with me to see that it might even be Hebrew tribes, lost tribes. We'll see. We're gonna look at the logic, what's what we have as uh, evidence, what's in the records, archaeological finds, the myths, the legends of the native tribes. And that's how we're gonna put all this together. It's gonna be pretty long, maybe two hours. Maybe two hours, you know, we're going to try to try to divide it into two videos. And um, if you don't like this, you know, you can just go to another channel, go watch some cute puppies somewhere in another channel. They got a million views, you know, the cute puppies, you know, and all that other stuff. Uh, if you want some wisdom, some knowledge, if you want to think about different things, you want to, uh, if you like history, mysteries, then you're going to love this video. And so I hope you like it, you know. You can see, this is just me against the world, right? Like my boy Pac said, right? Tupac Amaru. Where do you think he got that name? Tupac Amaru. Just like the Inca emperors. Alright, you think his mom didn't know? Where they were from? The original Incas, Mayas, Hopi, Algonquin. All right, we're gonna show you who they were. The Anasazi, the Aztecs, Copper Color. All right, tune in. Virtually none of Thanksgiving has an ounce of accuracy. You know, it's the bestseller, Lies My Teacher Told Me. The idea of Europe bringing civilization to the Americas simply flips truth on its head. This is what European explorers actually found in North America. Far and away the most beautiful city on Earth five times the size of London or Rome, great towers and buildings rising from the water, 60,000 gleaming houses and how spacious and how well built they were, of beautiful stonework and cedar wood and the wood of other sweet scented trees. The many streets and boulevards of the city were so neat and well swept despite the multitude of inhabitants, crisscrossed with a complex network of canals like an enormous Venice but also remarkable floating gardens that reminded of nowhere else on Earth. While Europe was drinking water from its polluted city rivers, huge aqueducts transported America's water from fresh springs. But what impressed most were the special merchant areas, where timber and tiles and other building materials were bought and sold, as well as greengrocer streets, where one could buy every sort of vegetable, fruits, honeys, nut paste and chocolates. Astonished by the personal cleanliness and hygiene of the colorfully dressed populace, and by their extravagant use of soaps, deodorants, and breath sweeteners. Most Europeans never bathed and kept clothes on at all times. The Pilgrim's Notes biographer Zini Finer had a terrible smell. Indians tried, quote, without success to teach them to bathe. The settlers also had bad breath from rotting teeth. Death and starvation was so common that corpses were just dumped in open pits known as pore holes. Many turned to alcohol and committed suicide. In fact, the story of the first settlers has been deliberately changed, notes author James Lowen, because the truth is so shameful. They actually settled hundreds of miles further south and stayed in America because the mission was a failure. Their real aim, reports historian Robert Beverly, was to find some gold and take it back to Europe. They spent their days digging random holes in the ground, haplessly looking for gold instead of planting crops. Soon they were starving and digging up putrid Indian corpses to eat. They took some Indian prisoners and forced them to teach the colonists how to farm. And the meal with the natives wasn't quite the Thanksgiving shown on TV and in school books. The colonists offered the Indians a toast to eternal friendship, whereupon the chief, his family, advisors, and 200 followers dropped dead of poison. 
In mainstream history books, perhaps the most common description of American territory then is virgin land. In fact, notes historian Peter Jennings, it was widowed, horrific enough the Nazi ethnic cleansings in Europe during World War II. Leading American studies professor David Stannard notes it's dwarfed by, quote, far and away the most massive act of genocide in the history of the world. The death of 100 million indigenous people in the, quote, American Holocaust, some from disease but also vast numbers from a deliberate policy aimed at wiping out the race that mainstream history books continue to pretend never happened. He knows when Heinrich Himmler called the final solution, quote, de-lousing, Himmler was only echoing the pilgrim army's rallying cry, Nits make lice, Nits being Indian babies. This was a map of Indian nations across the US. 80% of the first government's entire budget went on attacking existing Indian settlements to take their developed farmland. Settlers would most probably not have survived, writes Jennings, on their own. 95% of America's entire population was then wiped out. American Holocaust notes there is documented evidence of colonist leaders going town after town, deliberately killing all men, women and children. Yet school texts and history books remain silent. Orders came from the very top. Under the direct order of George Washington, at least 28 of 30 Seneca towns and all the towns of the Mohawk, Onondaga and Cayuga were simply obliterated. George Washington wrote the Indian country, quote, must be destroyed. Thomas Jefferson called to, quote, pursue Indians to extermination. Nobel Peace Prize winner Theodore Roosevelt called beneficial the eradication of the native race. Senate notes genocide was official public policy. California Governor Peter Burnett in his 1851 message to the legislature. Extermination must continue to be waged until the Indian becomes extinct. Another governor issued the public proclamation to, quote, pursue, kill, and destroy all Indians. A witness notes the ensuing bloodbaths practically wiped out the native race. The whites shoot them down like wolves, men, women, and children, wherever they could find them. This war of extermination against the Aborigines is tending to the final extinction of the race. What reportedly saved the race from extinction was their use of slave labor. This extermination policy has proved so injurious to the interests of the whites. Indian labor is indispensable. Highly prized slaves were Indian girls as young as three, said the Marysville appeal for fulfilling double roles of labor and of lust. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores four days before they robbed the graves of my ancestors and stole their corn, wheat, and beans. The Indians knew this fact, yet welcomed and befriended the settlers, little knowing that they would be killed by the settlers' guns. Yeah, so you see what they did, right? You see the real history. Check that book out if you can. Lies my teacher told me. That's what they were talking about. So... So, what I wanted to basically uh, point out is how the, the Spanish described the cities when they came. How beautiful they were, how big they were, how clean they were. Right? Bigger, five times bigger than London. Five times bigger than Rome, imagine. Five times bigger than Rome? Rome was pretty big. They conquered a lot of land. So, five times big as Rome, that's the whole continent. That's the whole America, north, south, central. They're talking about the Incas, the, all of them together. They were all connected, right? And then the other thing is how they were, uh, their hygiene. You know, that's the other thing, their hygiene. You know, how clean they were. They had deodorant, they made soap, they had breath mints, you know. They bathed. The, 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 you know, the colonists, they stank. The Europeans didn't bathe, they were nasty. You know, they didn't have that notion. Like, holy people would have, clean people would have, spiritual people would have. People who have a common sense and consciousness with nature to, like, you know, be clean, be pure. You know, so you see what they did. They just exterminated everybody. Now we're going to talk about their characteristics. Right? How, how would the Indians... Uh, characteristics, how were their personalities? That's what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, a descent, and that's from a descendant of colonists, right? Somebody who was in the 1800s writing a book. It's called uh, Popular uh, History of the United States. 
uh, from Mumble Original to the present day by uh, John Clark Ridpath, I believe, 1876. Regarding their characteristics, says right, the Indians were strongly marked with national peculiarities. The most striking characteristic of the race was a certain sense of personal independence, willfulness of action, freedom from restraint. You hear that? They want to be free. They're, they're independent people. They don't want to be ruled. To the red man's imagination, the idea of a civil authority which should subordinate his passions, curb his wills, and thwart his purposes was intolerable. Among this people, no common enterprise was possible unless made so by the currents of free wills. Okay? Intolerable. I know you feel like that too. It's intolerable. Injustice. It's no justice. Who was here before Columbus? I, mean, I know you see a lot of pictures of the Indians and the natives and you know, light skinned like me, long hair, a little bit like me, some look like Chinese, darker and stuff. But um that came after. That was the Mongolian Asian uh, migration. Okay, that was after. The original tribes were a couple colored, I'm gonna show you that's what I'm gonna show you right now. I was referencing the uh, Mayas earlier. all of that, um, the Aztecs, creation, like how it's very similar to the Bibles. Yeah. Now, what I'm about to tell you is, is, you know, might be out of your thinking, but what if I told you that the tribes that were here on this side of the world, American continents, north, south, central, a lot were biblical tribes talked about in the Old Testament as well as in reference to the Hebrew ones the Israelite tribes the tribes of Judah the tribes of you know the 12 tribes so it says here from etymology online let's go right there right now you see see what I'm showing you right here it's gonna be for a reason so, So Jahweh, right? Or let's see, what do we call Jehovah, right? Etymology. Trans Tinsdale transliteration of Hebrew tentagram Jahweh using the vowel points of Adonai, my Lord. See Jahweh. Use Jahweh. Okay, so let's go to Jahweh. Okay, let's read this very carefully now. Jahweh. 1869 hypothetical reconstruction of the tentagramation YHWH see Jehovah based on the assumption that the tentagramation is the imperfective of Hebrew bird Hawa earlier form of Heya was Heya was in the sense of the one who is the existence And so it says here, I am that I am. It is the common English translation of the response that God used in the Hebrew Bible when Moses asked for his name, Exodus 3.14. It is one of the most famous verses in the Torah. Heya means existed. In Hebrew, Eyeh is the first person singular in perfect form and is usually translated in Bible, uh, English Bible says I am or I will be. Or I shall be. For example, Ayer Asher Ayer literally translates as I am who I am. Okay, so what did it tell you? One of the most famous verses in the Torah. So it says here, in appearance it is possible to render Yahweh as an archaic third person singular and perfect form of Heya. To be, meaning, therefore he is. It is notably distinct from the root L, which can be used as simple noun to refer to the Creator, Deity, and General Creation agrees. Where God is represented as speaking, hence as used in the first person, Aya, I am. Other scholars regard the transcendental root of Hawa as more likely origin of the name Shawe, Hawa, and Heya. Earlier form of Heya, Hawa, Heya, 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 Heya. Now sing with me. Hey yeah, hey yeah, hey yeah, hey yeah, hey yeah. See what I'm trying to tell you? 
You think they were just saying hey yeah for nothing? So Yahweh, they were saying Yahweh in their way, in the original way. Oh Lord, oh God, Creator, I am, He exists to be. Okay? The most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. You trade in your reality for a role. You trade in your sense for an act. You give up your ability to feel and exchange, put on a mask. There can't be any large-scale revolution until there's a personal revolution on an individual level. It's got to happen inside first. Hey, uh, hey, uh. So it says here, Webster's Dictionary, 1828, American, adjective pertaining to America, American. A noun, a native of America, originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. All right, I don't know if you guys just understood that, but I'll, I'll do it one more time. In Webster's Dictionary, 1828. American, originally applied to the aboriginals or copper-colored races found here by the Europeans. Copper-colored races. Copper-colored races. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Copper colored races. The original inhabitants of America were of dark complexion, dark people. The lighter Asian Mongolians came later. Do you know your history? Do you know who you are? Continuing in the book, A Popular History of the United States of America from John Clark Ridpath. Uh, it says, Beyond the Rocky Mountains are the Indian na nations of the plains, the great family of the Shoshones, the Selish, the Klamats, the Californians. On the Pacific slope farther south were dwelt in former times the famous races of the Aztecs and Toltecs. These were the most civilized of the primitive Indian nations, but at the same time among the most feeble and the best builders in wood and stone but at least war like of any of the aborigines. Yeah, right. Such a brief sketch of the distribution of the copper-colored race in the New World. So again, such is a brief sketch of the distribution of the copper-colored race in the New World. Do you know who you are? Can you remember? Hey, yeah, hey, yeah. You know who you are. Chief. Chief. Dark. This is their drawings. Do you know who you are? Californian Indians. Old picture. You know who you are. Originally applied to the aboriginals or copper color races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. Hey.
copper color. Now his next pictures are like especially from my uh, people up in Boston and uh, New England area you can kind of, I'm gonna show you what tribes were over there during that time you know when the pilgrims came you know for Thanksgiving I mean you saw the video that reported from RT how they poisoned the chiefs and everybody they invited them for dinner then they poisoned them that was the Thanksgiving right there these people were starving and right, I'm gonna show you the people that were here you know and they look <laughs> I don't know hopefully my Kiverdian people are watching this, you can see, because a lot of those people were brought to Kiverdian that were in New England. The Portuguese and the Dutch and all these people, they brought them to Kiverdian. You know, the whole Labrador Indians, Nova Scotia, New England, a lot of them were Algonquin, so a lot of them were taken uh, to the Botox. The whole nation of Botox were taken to the Kiverdian Islands. And so I'm going to show you how these people looked in this region. And it's funny, they look like them. They, they, some of them look Kiverdian. So, are you really African? <laughs> so, I'm just saying, think about it, you know, like. This is uh, the book, Lies My Teacher Told Me. Really good book, I read it a long time ago. In 1501, the Portuguese began to depopulate Labrador, transporting the now extinct Botox Indians to Europe and Cape Verde as slaves. After the British established beachheads on the Atlantic coast of North America, they encouraged coastal Indian tribes to capture and sell members of more, more distant tribes, more distant tribes. Charleston, South Carolina became a major port for exporting Indian slaves. The Pilgrims and Puritans sold the survivors of the Pequa War into slavery in Bermuda in 1637. The French shipped virtually the entire Natchez nation uh, in chains to the West Indies in 1731. The Botok are the aboriginal people of the island of Newfoundland. They were Algonquin-speaking hunter-gatherers who probably numbered less than a thousand people at the time of European contact. Probably, they say, right? The Botok are the descendants of the recent Indian culture called the Little Passage Complex. And it says here, uh, the case of Santu, right? It's an extract from Frank Speck's uh, book, Botok and Micmac, 1922, page 55 to 70. And uh, it says, the most surprising occurrence, however, in recent years concerning the fate of the Beltok Indians was the accidental discovery of an old Indian woman named Santu, who claimed that her father was one of the last survivors of the Red Indians of Newfoundland. Since considerable discussion was aroused over the innocent claim of the old woman when I had made public, I shall give the circumstances in some detail for the benefit of those who may wish to determine to what extent her testimony may be relied on before making use of the information and the brief vocabulary obtained from her. Yeah, so this is uh, Shana Titit. This is the last known Botox, Biltok Indian alive. Uh, this is the patient. Uh, look at the features. Doesn't look like the red native uh, American that they show us in pictures. This looks a lot different. This more, looks more like people I know in Boston or any part of the world. It could be anything, but just look at the features. All right. So uh, these are all the areas that are. Well, these are the areas that I'm going to reference now. The tribes that I'm going to show you. Not all of them, but um, I can show you a little bit of the Wampanoag, the Narragansett, uh, the Nipmuc. Uh, what's about uh, the Massasoit, the Shinnecock, the Montauk. We're also going to show you some pictures of the Martha's Vineyard uh, native and the last Nantucket native. So, if you want to research all the rest of them, just go ahead and do it on your own. You'll start seeing the, the features and, and what I'm talking about. All right. So this is the New England area. This is what the Pilgrims encountered. This is the areas.
Geronimo once said, I was born on the prairies where the wind blow free, and there was nothing to break the light of the sun. Since the differences among the several Indian tribes are far less than has been supposed, Brinton argued that Brinton argued and he went on to assert that the Aztecs of Mexico and the Algonquins of the eastern United States were not far apart. If we overlook the objective art of architecture in one or two inventions and to conclude that the American culture, wherever examined, presents a family likeness which the more careful servers of late years have taken pains to put in strong light. A common American Indian culture had developed out of inherent features, Brinkton sought to show, and this culture had political system and architecture surpassing anything achieved by Africans or Polynesians and a stone clay and wood artistry that stands next to, uh, well he says that of the white race, of course his race. Okay, so there you go, he's saying how they resemble the Algonquins, uh, the uh, Aztecs. Alright, so why I wanted to show you this, you know, why did I want to show you this? Because we're talking about orientation, at first I had to get you to stop spinning. Now I need you to understand some history, some real history connected with the Bible and what, you know, how it all fits together. Okay, so in the Larkin Museum in Lima, Peru, lightning. You heard the lightning? Because we're breaking the spell, baby. The energy in the air is like, wow. I'm going to continue with that. I hope you didn't get scared. So it says in Lima, Peru, there is a photograph of the Inca noble man and his son's painting with this quote from Garcia Lasso de la Vega below it. So what are we seeing here? Black noble people, Incas. Hey, what is this? Depicting the Inca emperors, this panel from the Larco Museum in Lima, Peru, it shows the last seven. Inca emperors and if you notice also the first European emperor of the Inca the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V a black man now we're gonna get into the how the 
Europe, everybody was dark skinned too. Okay, like we're gonna get into that. I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna show you this. Okay. So this painting can be dated back to the 1800s because the last two entries of that Carlos III as the 24th Inca Emperor and his son Carlos IV, House of Bourbon, as the 25th Inca Emperor. So he reigned as King of Spain from December 14, 1788 to March 1808. What are we talking about here? I'm going to get into this right here. Japheth. Much of modern Russia, parts of modern Georgia, and the Caucasus region hunts ancient Masaka, Musash, Moshi, Mosca, and Muscovy in Cappadocia, Moscow, reflects the old name possible migration as far as South America. So it says, starts right here, goes off to Asia. Possibly the Moshe in cultures in South America and now dead Moshika languages in Peru. In Peru. Moshe warrior, Moshe, Moshika. Wikipedia, Meshach. Well, in the Bible, Meshach or Moshak, Hebrew, price or precious. It's named of the son of Japheth in Genesis 10 2 and 1 Chronicles 1 5. Another Meshach is named as the son of Aram in 1 Chronicles 1.17. The son of Japheth, remember, Meshach. Genesis 10.151 in Chronicles 1.17. Moshach, the Moshachem. Greek, called them the Cappadocians. Homeland, Turkey City, Masaka, modern Kayseri, Turkey. A trace of the occupation of the high platform of Asia Minor by this people is found in the old name for the great capital city called in later times Caesarea, Caesarea, right? Which was Masaka. Josephus speaks of this town as founded by the Meshach, the son of Japhet, whom he makes the project, the progenitor of the Mosecheni or Mos Moshi, the Moshi, the Mosecheni or the Moshi and the Mososheni were founded by Moshok. Mososh, Moso. Now they are Cappadocians. There is also a mark of their ancient denomination still to be shewed. For there is even now among them a city called Masaka. Masaka, remember that, Masaka. Which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called. So the entire nation was once called Masaka or Mosak, right? Moshek, Mosak, Meshek, the whole nation. And for there is even now among them a city called Masaka, which may inform those who are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called. So they're saying that they were called Meshek, 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 right? Meshek. We're going to hear about the Meshika and the Moshe people. Meshek. We're going to learn about the Phoenician speaking Mexica and the Inca speaking Mexica. And the Aztec's ancient name is Mexica. We're going to learn all that. So it continues here Meshek, which means drawing out. Sons for Dedan, Saren, and Shezbashi Nelson. Another word is Meshek, Mesek, Meshek, Meshwesh, Meshki, Meshera, Munch, Munchki. Mushki, Mishi, Muski, Mushku, Masku, Muskiva, Muska, Muska, Muskai, Maskali, Mashar, Maskusi, Masaka, Masaka, Mach, Mashketos, Mochketos, Moderes, Moshki, Moshki, Mosa, Mosher, Mosh, Moshis, Mososh, Moshi, Moshien, Moshakian. Moshok, Moshok, Moshoi, Mosochen, Mosochen, Mosims, Mosinoeshi, Moska, Moscovi, Moscow, Muscovites, Latvians, Litu Lithuanians, Romanians, other related groups. So Masaka is the ancient name for the capital of Cappadocia. What does the word Meshek mean? In the Aramaic language, that the Phoenicians generally spoke Mexica. Remember that word, Mexica. They spoke Mexica. The real word for Meshek means Messiah. In Turkish, a similar word means Mes, Messi, or Meshi. 
Moshe, Wikipedia. Moses or Moshe is a male given name after the biblical figure Moses. According to the Torah, the name Moses comes from the Hebrew verb meaning to pull out or draw out of water. So, to pull out or draw out. Where do we see that? Let's go back. Meshek, drawing out. Meshek, drawing out. What does Meshek mean? What does it mean? It means Messiah. Messiah. Moshe. Right? Meshek, Moshe. Moses. To draw out. Meshek, Moshe. Of what? The story of the Aztec. Now, this is why I keep bringing you back to the uh, Americas. Now, remember, I showed you who the copper colored people were, right? Like the American dictionary says, right? The story of the Aztec, Exodus, to what is now Mexico City, contains elements that are unmistakably like those of the Moses myth. For example, the Aztecs were enslaved for a number of years by the evil king. Then a prophet, Meshi, led them on their search for the promised land. Meshi, almost like the Hebrew Moshe, Moses. Here, so it says here, here's the account of the migration of the Aztecs by historian Fray Diego Duran. In the year 1193, after the birth of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Aztec nation reached this land. These people, like others who populated the country, departed from seven caves in a land called Aslan. The people were called Aztec, which means people of whiteness. They were also called Mesitim or Mexicans, in honor of the priest Lord who guided them. Mexic, right? Mexicans. So it says, we at the Americas know them as the Mexica. Mexica? What did the Phoenicians speak? In the Arabic language that the Phoenicians generally spoke, Mexica. We of the Americas know them as Mexica. Who are the Mexica? Mexican. Mexica is their Nahuatl name. And Michoacan in Mexico. Moshe or Mexica in Peru. Mosquito in Nicaragua. Here in the United States, they are called Muskegon, Muskogee, Michigan, Mojica, etc. The Hopi origin myths speak of the Mosque, where they once lived. All right, so we remember, right, the Meshach, right? The son of Japheth, the Meshachs, right? They ruled the India, Asia, all those areas. It seems that they were following a certain uh, migration path because they were able to trace them to South America and the, the American tribes. So again, Meshach, right? Meshach, Meshika. Meshek means Mesh look. So in the Arabic language, the Phoenicians generally spoke Meshika. Meshek means Messiah. Messiah, Meshi, Moshe, Moises, Moses, Moshe. Alright? So it says, they were also called the Mesitin or Meshikans, Meshik, in honor of the priest and Lord who guided them. In honor of the priest, Lord, who guided them, whose name was Meshi. Meshi. Okay, so what? Check this out. In Phoenicians generally spoke Meshika. The real word for Meshek means Messiah. In Turkish, a similar word means Messi or Meshi. Moshe. Moses or Moshe is a male given name after the biblical figure Moses. And what the wik this is Wikipedia? Meshika. The Nahual pronunciation or Mexicas were indigenous peoples of the Valley of Mexico, known today as the rulers of the Aztec Empire. And so the Aztec had a story unmistakably like those of the Moses Smith or Moshe. Right? Moses Moshe. Moshe, Messiah. And who are the Mexica? What did the Phoenicians speak? Mexica? They were the Aztec. The Aztecs referred themselves as the Mexica or the Tenochtitlan, or the Native American people who dominated northern Mexico at the time of Spanish conquest. The Mexica are eponymous of the place named Mexico. This refers to the interconnected settlements in the valley which became the site of what is now Mexico City, which held natural and geographical and population advantages. I had the Tarascan Indians of Michoacan, Descend from the Taras Shakas, Scythian chiefs of Taras, Polestar pirates and navigators, 
because they were so close relative to the biblical Meshechs, they also called themselves the Meshechana, Meshech tribe, which later became Mishrakan. The legends of the Aztecs stated that they, the Meshika or Shiva Phoenicians, were once partners of the Tarascans, just as the Bible says. Now we have, there was a group of people known of the, as Moshe, or Moshi, or Meshera, in the Peru, South America. The Moshe civilization, also known as the Moshika. Okay, Moshe, so say Moshika, Meshika. Okay, what is the difference? Moshika, Meshika, flourished along the northern coast and valleys of ancient Peru, in particular in the Chicama and Trujillo valleys between 1 CE and 800 CE. What does it say about Moshika in Wikipedia? It tells us it's a Chimuan language, formally spoken. So Moshika, a language. Where do we see Moshika language? The Phoenicians generally spoke Moshika language. A Chimuan language for Moshika formerly spoken along the northwest coast of Peru and inland village. First documented in 1607, the language was widely spoken in the area during the 17th and the early 18th century. By the end of 19th century, the language was dying out and spoken only in the few people in the village of Eton and Ch Ch Chiclayo, or almost like Chicago. <coughs> it died out, spoken around 1920, 1920, so just a hundred years ago, it still existed, all right? All right, so the Meshechs, right? They went all the way to South America, man. I'm telling you, you saw the connections there. If you look up the etymology of the word, you will find all this stuff, you know, you're connected. So we're going back, you know, we keep going back. We keep, we keep, it keeps telling us we're going to America, baby. We're, we're, we're going somewhere. We're, we're gonna trace this, you know. We're we're gonna see this, okay? So uh, okay, so we're, so far we got like a lot of things pointing to like Hebrew tribes in America, the natives. I mean, all right. So I'm gonna keep pulling out some more things. So we're talking about these Hebrew Israelite tribes, right? Who were these Hebrews? Hebrews. <laughs> Remember, every word has meaning. So E, I want you to bring your focus onto Eber. So from Shem came Arkfasad, or Akfashad, Shalah, then Eber, or Salah, Eber. So let's look at another. So we have from Adam, we have Seth, you know, and then came from Seth Noah. From Noah came Shem, and Shem had Arfasad. Salah and Eber. Eber had Pele. So who is this Heber? The word Hebrew, descendants of Eber, those that did not build the Tower of Babel. Okay, so. so it says Hebrew does not mean Jew, although some Judeans may be Hebrews. Genetically speaking, Hebrew means any descendant of Eber or Eber. Eber, an ancestor of Abraham, was the great great grandson of Noah. Spiritually and behaviorally, Hebrew carries inherently politically divisive connotations. So, look at what this word Eber also carries the, the meaning and, and the energy. So, it means separated, the other side, those who live on the other side, independent, stateless, not the subjects of any human ruler, foreign to all worldly nations, migratory, beyond that which is beyond. Soyuner on the earth, one who is passing through, passer through, as distinct from a settler in the land or resident of the nations, descending either behaviorally or genetically from Ever, following the path of Abraham, living according to the separatist holiness instructions of Abraham's Elohim, Jawe. Okay, so let's keep reading. I just want to you understand what's going on here. So, so after Noah landed the ark, his wife birthed him a son named Shem, from who came a man the Bible names as Eber. Eber resisted Nimrod's command to build the Tower of Babel, 
in an act of outrageous disloyalty to Nimrod, Eber crossed over from Babylon to the land across the river. In the wilderness, Eber and his people retained the Hebrew language. Meanwhile, back in Babylon, Hawa, Heya, Hawa confused the languages of everyone else. The name Hebrew rests on Abraham, whose name comes from that of his great granddaddy Hebrew. You can find this on this website here. So, what's important here? So, we all know the, tar- the story of the Tower of Babel. Huh? You know, the humans were getting too close to God, and that God didn't like that, and so he tore- took down the Babel because he didn't want them to know, you know, be like the gods, right? That's what it says in the Bible, the gods, right? <clears throat> so, he didn't. You know, him and his family didn't partake. So what he, what did he do? What did he? So what does it say he did? He separated those who live on the other side. They became independent, no foreign ruler. So what they, they, they bounced, they left, and they went into the wilderness, where they retained their Hebrew language, land across the river. Okay, so very important. So what are we talking about here? Huh? Eber, Hebrew. Tiberian Hebrew, Eber, is an ancestor of the Israelites. According to the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, 11 and 1 Chronicles 1, he was a great-grandson of Noah's son, Shem, and the father of Peleg, born when Eber was 34 uh, years old, and of Joktan. He was the son of Selah, a distant ancestor of Abraham. According to the Hebrew Bible, Eber died at the age of 464, when Jacob was 20. And look what this says again. And this is from Wikipedia. According to Abu Isa, and a lot of people know who that is, you know, Eber, the great grandson of Shem, refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel. So his language was not confused when it was abandoned. He and his family alone retained the original human language, a concept referred to as lingua humana in Latin. Hebrew. A language named after Eber. So you see what is what are they what are they te- what are they telling us here, man? <laughs> they kept the original language, and they didn't build. They didn't help build the tower. They bounced. They went somewhere else. Okay, so he separated himself from the other tribes. Okay, <clears throat> where did they go to? And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. So look what he's telling us here. So he had a son named Peleg, and it says that in his days, during Peleg's day, the earth was divided. What does that mean? Separated, maybe the lands? Cataclysm? Atlantis, separation, separated, the earth divided. Chronicles 119, 1 Chronicles 119, And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, because in his days the earth was divided. His brother's name was Joktan. Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. Okay, so these are all the accounts of Eber in the Bible. Okay. So it says the Hebrew word, etymology. The origin of the term remains uncertain. That's what they say. But a biblical term, Ivri, right? Ivri, Ivri, meaning to traverse or pass over, is usually rendered as Hebrew in English from the ancient Greek. In plural, it is Ivri or Ibrim. Terracotta head of Semite marked Hebrew by Petri from Memphis, Foreign Quarter, Egypt, Greco Roman period, the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology of London. In Genesis 10 21, Shem, the elder brother of Ham and Japheth, firstborn of son of Noah, is referred to as the father of the sons of Eber, which may have a similar meaning. Some authors argue that Eber denotes the descendants of the biblical patriarch Eber son of Shelah, a great-grandson of Noah, and an ancestor of Abraham. 
it says here Hebrew adjective from Latin Hebraeus, from Greek Hebraeus, from Aramaic Semitic Hebrai, corresponding to Hebrew Ibri in Israelite, traditionally from an ancestral name Eber, but probably literally one from the other side perhaps in reference to the river Euphrates or perhaps simply signifying immigrant immigrant from Eber region on the other or opposite side boom my immigrants so they refused to build the tower right and they went to the other side so check this out just look at this Pangea right So the land of Hebrew, Shem, Hengen. These were all melanated, copper colored people. The whole earth was. So it's not about white and black, but that's another topic. So once again, we read about Eber, and uh, these are the 10 tribes. So, so 2 Ezra 13 40 44. Remember, this is a apocryphal book, it was taken out of the original uh, Bibles. This was found, a lot of this was found, it was destroyed. Uh, when they had it, they actually destroyed this book. And a lot of this, uh, a lot of it was found after. Like in the Dead Sea Scrolls and and all that. So, 2 Ezra 1340 tells us, These are the ten tribes that were taken captives from their land in the days of King Hosea, whom King Shalmaneser of the Assyrians took across the river as captive. They were taken into another land. But they made this plan for themselves. They will leave the multitude of the nations and go into a more remote region where the human race had never lived. There they would be able to observe their customs, which they hadn't kept in their own region. They went in through the narrow passages of the Euphrates River. Then the Most High gave them signs and stopped the flow of the river until they had passed. So. What is it saying there? And there's a lot of versions, obviously, I would say, in, in different English. Well, so, look what it's telling us. And they took this book out. You know, so they went captive to another land, but they was like, you know what, let's just go over there. Let's separate ourselves. Right? Just like it says Eber and his family did when they didn't want to build a tower. Okay? Where do they go? Where the human race had never lived. All right, so keep that in mind. So, all right, so it says here about the uh, Indians, or how they call them, red man, right? Red man, red, dark red man, copper. The name Indian was conferred upon them from the real or fancied resemblance to the people of India. If we know the ancient Indians were really Copper colored as well, then yes, that's why they call them India. And also, outside of Europe, a lot of places were called, well, most places, uh, the continents were called the Three Indias. You know, like, if you know the sort of Prester John and the Three Indias, or just a reference of the Indias and the Indies, usually uh, in reference to people of color where they, they live. But with does any such such similarity, the name would have been the same for Columbus and his followers, believing that they had only rediscovered the Indies, would of course call the inhabitants Indians, according to uh, John Clark. The origin of the North American Indians is involved in complete obscurity. That they are one of the older races of mankind cannot be doubted. Okay, so they are one of the oldest, okay, original. He said it can't be doubted. All right, but at what date or by what route they came to the western continent is an unsolved problem okay so he doesn't know they don't know how they got there they don't know anything right okay so am I the only one saying that the uh, natives might be Hebrew lost tribes is this my concept or my idea it's not I'm gonna show you how this is actually something that's been talked about for centuries already and why and, I can, and hopefully you see with the archaeological stuff, the biblical stuff, and just senses, using your senses, right? Using your sight, hearing, your intuition. You gotta use them, your heart. We'll try to put this together. As Maya Angelou says, 
Wouldn't it be wonderful when black history, Native American history, and Jewish history, and all of U.S. history is taught from one book? Just U.S. history. What is she trying to tell you right there? Think about it. And Isaiah 513, therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. No knowledge. Yeah, so talking about captivity and slavery, you know. I want to bring your attention to the dumb diversus, the Papa Vu. Okay? This is something that was done in 1452 by Pope Nicholas V, right? So let's read here what it says in Wikipedia. So it says dumb diversus, which means until different. You hear that? Until different. Is a papal bull issued on 18 of June 1452 by Pope Nicholas V. It authorized Alonso V of Portugal to conquer Saracens and pagans and consign them to perpetual servitude. Alright, so what does that mean, you know, perpetual slavery? And who are these Saracens and pagans? You know, what, what exactly does that mean? Because remember, this is 1452. Before they traveled to America, right? 1492 is when Columbus discovered America, right? So what they were doing? They were plotting. They were planning. They were getting all the permits. All the political stuff agreed upon with the kings. Right? They're going to go invade, right? So I want to read you some more of this dumb diverses, right? So it says, The doctrine of discovery, also called the doctrine of Christian discovery, is founded on a series of papal bulls or edicts written between 1452 and 1493. The first was from Pope Nicholas V in 1452 called the Dumb Diverses. And it states the following, so pay attention to this, right? So, who are in the Americas, right? So, we want to grant you, King of Portugal, full and free power through the apostolic authority by this edict to invade, conquer, fight, subjugate the Saracens Muslims and pagans and other infidels and other enemies of Christ and wherever established their kingdoms, right? Their kingdoms, their duchies, their royal palaces, their principalities and other dominions, lands, places, estates, camps and any other possessions, mobile and immobile, goods found in all these places and held in whatever name and held and possessed by the same and to lead their presence in perpetual servitude. Perpetual servitude. That means you're still a slave. You understand what this is saying? They gave permission. Look at the uh, description. Saracens, Muslims, and pagans, and any other infidels of other enemies of Christ. That's anybody who didn't go down with the Roman Catholic at that time. Anybody. Anybody. The Indians. Anybody in the world. Anybody. Especially the Indians. So they were already getting ready for this, okay? You see what this is, right? And before Columbus went, he knew where he was doing. He knew where he was going. They were already setting him up for that, all right? So I'm going to show you that. All right, so yeah, once one more time. Again, the Papa Bull, 1452, Dumb Diverses. Pope Nicholas V authorizes King Alonso V of Portugal to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. So basically, Christians encountering non-Christians could take everything. You hear that? Everything. Even if these people had kingdoms, even if these people were already Jews and they had religions and their, and their empires and their cities, and even if they lived in peace, everything. They got permission. So I'm going to show you what Columbus knew before he came to America. It wasn't no mistake. He didn't get lost. Let me show you. Yeah, so uh, Columbus wasn't so innocent. And, it, and, you know, like Bob Marley says, half the story has never been told, you know. Uh, when in regarding of Christopher Columbus, all his life Columbus' ideas about geography were permeated with a peculiar religious mysticism. He kept a book of prophecies in which he collected quotations mostly from the Bible, often those dealing with uh, I, I, Isles far off. 
or islands, right? Or lands. He kept a book of prophecies in which he collected quotations, mostly from the Bible, often those dealing with isles far off, lands, or islands. That seemed to prof prophesy his own discoveries. We're told a certain story in school about Columbus, and it's not even close to being true. Okay, so he was never lost. He knew where he was going. He called them Indians because the rest of the world was called the Three Indias, and the Indies was known as the Indies, the America. So he knew where he was going, okay? So he wrote a book. It's called The Book of Prophecies by Christopher Columbus. You know, if you look for it on the internet, it's there. I'll try to put the link here. If you need it, just let me know. I got it. So, um, you know, this book, basically, he describes what he's intention is why he's going to the Americas what well, who's he doing it for and and you know that he basically feels like he is uh, a prophet like he's 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 basically fulfilling a, a a prophecy by discovering America the Indians right why because we're gonna learn who they were he knew who they were he knew they were Jews he knew those was the lost um, tribes he knew Jerusalem was over there he knew Mount Zion was over there and I'm gonna let you see that from his words right now here from an excerpt of the book amongst the earliest and most fascinating witnesses to the latter is a manuscript of 84 folios dated between September 13th 1501 and March 23rd 1502 and now preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Sevilla okay this is preserved in a prestige library in Spain. It begins, and this is in Christopher Columbus' own words. This is the beginning of the book or collection of author authorities, sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city and Mount Zion, and the discovery and conversion of the islands of the Indies and all of peoples and nations for Ferdinand and Isabella are Spanish rulers. It says, This manuscript, commonly known as El Libro de las Profecias or Book of Prophecies, was compiled by Christopher Columbus himself in collaboration with Gaspar Gorizio, a Cartusian monk of Italian origin who belonged to the monastery of Santa Maria de las Cuevas in Sevilla. Okay, so again, what did it say? <laughs> that he is going to recover the holy city and Mount Zion and also for the discovery and conversion of the islands of the Indies and the peoples and nations he know what's over there what is he saying it's in America the holy city what's the holy city Jerusalem we're gonna see that in another video that's in Peru Mount Zion you know Mount Zion the navel of the world, the center of the world. Cusco is the center of the world. The name Cusco means navel of the world. Mount Zion is considered the navel of the world. Jerusalem is considered the navel of the world. Peru, Cusco means navel of the world. So that's just another video, but just you can see Christopher Columbus knew where he was going and who was over there. Okay, so I'm going to continue here. A transcription of the set, September 13, 1501 letter in which Columbus explained the project and asked for assistance. So this is where he's saying, right? Reverend and very devoted father, when I came here to Granada, where is Granada? Caribbean, right? Okay. I began to collect in a book of excerpts from authorities, authoritative, <laughs> sorry, I began to collect in book excerpts from authoritative sources that seemed to me to refer to Jerusalem. I plan to review them later and to arrange them appropriately. Then I became involved in my other activities and did not have time to proceed with my work, nor do I now. So he's too busy conquering and killing people. You understand? So, then I became involved, well, let's go, sorry. And, also, and so I am sending the book to you so that you can look at it. Perhaps your soul will motivate you to continue the project that our Lord will guide you to genuine authorities. The search for text should be continued in the Bible and the commentary. It is often useful and should be used for clarification. And that was Christopher Columbus, Book of Prophecies. Libro de las Profecias, or the Book of Prophecies by Christopher Columbus. He knew what he was coming to do. And he had the permission, Dom Diversus, from the Pope, Nicholas, 
They already had set it up. They came to conquer. They knew what they were doing. They wrote us a lie, a history, a bullshit, and we still believe it. Now, here's some more evidence about Hebrews in America. And it says here, in order to provide a truthful and reliable account of the origins of these Indian nations, an origin so doubtful and obscure, we would need some divine revelation or assistance to reveal this origin to us and help us understand it. However, lacking that revelation, we can only speculate and conjecture about these beginnings. Basing ourselves on the evidence provided by these people whose strange ways conduct and lowly actions are so like those of the Hebrews. Like who? Like the Hebrews. Thus we can almost positively affirm that they are Jews and Hebrews. And I would not commit a great error if I were to state this is as fact. Considering their way of life, their ceremonies, their rites and superstitions, their omens and hypocrisies, so akin to and characteristic of those of the Jews, in no way do they seem to defer. The Holy Scriptures bear witness to this, and from them we draw proofs and reasons for holding this opinion to be true. Chapter 1 It says here in the Museum of the Jewish People, the Myth of the Lost Tribes. It says here, in South America, the hypothesis connecting the American Indians to the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel was advanced mainly by Spanish missionaries and travelers while coming across impressive archaeological remains of the pre-Columbian civilizations or investigating the way of life of local tribes believed to recognize various customs and beliefs that they related to the Bible and Judaism. Most reports refer to native tribes living in regions that today are part of Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Peru but also in the countries of Central America, especially Mexico. Among the prominent expos expo expositors of those theories, a mention should be made of Father Diego Duran, 1588, author of the Aztecs, the history of the Indies of the New Spain, Father Gregorio Garcia, and his origin, De los Indios de los Nuevo Mundo, 1729. All right, here we are at the Jewish Virtual Library. And this is uh, regarding Montesinos, well, Antonio de Montesinos, right? So we're going to learn who he was and what he said about his encounter here in the Americas, okay? Jewish Library, a project of base, okay? It says here, Montesinos Antonio, Marano traveler on a trip to South America during 1641-42, Montesinos discovered a group of natives in Ecuador who could recite the Shema and were acquainted with other Jewish rituals. He brought this news to Amsterdam in 1644 and the congregational authorities, Manaseb and Israel, among them had him repeat his account under oath. So Manaseh Ben Israel. You can see who that is. Very important uh, Jewish scholar. That the assumption was that these natives were a remnant of the ten lost tribes of the tribes of Reuben and Levi, according to Montesinos. He then left for Brazil, where he died, reasserting on his deathbed to the, the truth of his report. Manasseh Ben Israel dwells in Montesinos' discovery in a booklet entitled Esperanza de Israel, the hope of Israel in Amsterdam 1650, which I'm about to show you right now, right after this, which he dedicated to the British Parliament, appending it, appending it to the petition for the readmittance of Jews to England. His thesis was that Montesinos' account points to an imminent fulfillment of Messianic prophecy of the lost tribes of Israel being reunited with Judah. The Montesinos report aroused literally interest even outside Jewish circles. In 1650, Thomas Thorogood publishes a use in America, or probabilities that the Americans are of that race. We also have this book. We're gonna. Who is uh, this guy, right? It says Manuel Dios Soedo, better known by his Hebrew name Menasseh ben Israel, also Menashe ben Joseph ben Israel also known with his Hebrew acronym B MBY, was a Portuguese rabbi, Kabbalist, writer, 
diplomat, printer, and publisher, founder of the first Hebrew printing press named Emeth Meretz Tisma in Amsterdam. The Hope of Israel by Menasseh in Israel, and Hebrew divine and philosopher, it says here, right? It says The Hope of Israel, right? It's a book that he wrote. In addition to messianic and other mystic hopes, where the current in England, his book, The Hope of Israel, had first been published in Amsterdam in Hebrew, Mishke Israel, and in Latin, Spes Israelis. In 1651, he offered to serve Christina, Queen of Sweden, as her agent of Hebrew books. Okay, so he's mad important, right? In 1652, his book was translated into English and published in London, prefixed with the dedication to the Parliament and the Council of State. His account of descendants of the lost tribes being found in the New World deeply impressed public opinion and stirred up many polemics in English literature. All right, so okay, so what what does it just say? It says his accounts of the descendants of the lost tribes being found in the New World deeply impressed public opinion and stirred up many polemics in English literature. You see. Says here, the Indians of the Yucatan and the Acusanitenses do circumcise themselves. The Teutonians of New Spain and Mexicans, as Roman and Gomasa in the general history of the Indians testify, brand their garments if there were happen any sudden misfortune or death of any. Gregorius Gracious in Monarchia in Gasonum and Isle of Peru says that the Guanacapus, hearing that his sonne Atahualpa fled for fear of the army of his enemy, he ran his garments. The Mexicans and Teutonians of the Totocanensis kept continually fire upon their altars, as God commanded in Leviticus. Those of Peru do the same in their temples dedicated to the sun. The Nicaraguenses do forbid their women who were, who were lately brought a, a, brought a bed to enter their temples till they are purified. The inhabitants of Hispaniola think those do sin who lie with a woman lie after her childbirth and the Indians of New Spain do severely punish sodomy. Many of the Indians do bury the dead on the mountains, which also is a Jewish cut tone, and Garcia said that the name Shanan is found in those countries. You may wonder at this, that the Indians do every 50 years celebrate Jubilee with great pomp in Mexico and metropolis of the whole province. Also, that on the Sabbath day, all are bound to be present in the temple to perform their sacrifices and ceremonies. They also were discovered from their wives. They they also were divorced from their wives if they were not honest. The Indians of Peru, New Spain, and Guatemala did marry the widows of their dead brethren. May not you judge from these things that the Jews lived in those places, and that the Gentiles learned such things of them? Added also to what has been said that the knowledge which the Indians had of the creation of the world and of the universe the universal flood they borrowed from the Israelites. So this is the book Menasseh ben Israel and his world. All right. It says the rise and fall of the Jewish Indian theory. Okay, so it says here, whenever I tell students in America that there was a serious theory years ago that the Indian Indians were Jews and that some of the lost tribes were located in America, they took blankly. They look blankly at me and if it's 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 my nonsense or they laughed embarrassedly to be in a room where such things are said. However, I quickly try to calm their fears by pointing out that after Columbus met the Indians in 1492, there was a problem accounting for who they were and where they came from. Okay, again, nobody knew who they were or where they came from, right? If everyone on the surface of the earth was a descendant of Adam and Eve, and the seven survivors of the flood, then the Indians had to be connected to the biblical world. Columbus himself had no problem. He thought they were Asians, since he was sure that he had reached Cate. That's what the story is, right? It says, explorers and missionaries offered theories tracing the Indians back to migrations from the Middle East, from Phoenicia, Arabia, or maybe from Solomon's Ophir. To deny a biblical origin for the Indians was to see them in their history as outside of the scripture and scripture as incomplete and in, in inadequate, inadequate. Okay. To deny a biblical origin for the Indians was to see them and their history as outside of scripture, and scripture as incomplete and inadequate. 
Only a few hardly souls in the 16th century dared suggest this. Paracelsus, Giordano, Bruno, Christopher Marlowe, and maybe Sir Walter Raleigh. It's a little more down below it says here regarding the Puritans and what they thought about the uh, colonists because a lot of them were saying that you know they were Satan's children and they were wild, they were savage, you know. So according to the Puritans, because they were living there, it says besides the settler missionaries found matters in Massachusetts Bay Colony quite different than Meade had described. They found docile, friendly Indians, some of whom wanted to become Christians, according to them, right? I don't know if they would really want to become Christians. They established schools for them, and they tried to get the great John Comenius to use Harvard as the center of universal enlightenment for Indians and Europeans. They translated the scriptures for the Indians. It says, and it continues, so pay attention to this part. The missionaries began to suspect something radically different was going on in the environs of Boston, namely, namely that pure English Christians were baptizing and converting Indians who were Jews. Wow. All right. What were they doing? They were baptizing and converting Indians who were Jews. So that's what the Puritan, Puritans were realizing. And if the Indians were Jews, an enormous missionary effort would be needed. So on behalf of the New England Missionary Society, volume was written by the Norfolk preacher one Thomas Thorogood called Jews in America, or the probability that the Indians are Jews. This was dedicated to Charles I. Okay. He had heard from the most learned Jewish writer of the time, his friend and co-worker Menasseh ben Israel, that Portuguese Marano explorer Antonio de Montesinos had encountered a Jewish tribe in the Andes Mountains. He knew that Menasseh had had Montesinos who came to answer in 1644 give his account before a notary. So Dury, who was at the time planning to set up a college of Jewish studies in London with Menasseh, as one of his three professors wrote Manasseh for a copy of the Montesinos report. Unconvinced until he was finally willing to say that the group encountered by Montesinos could be part of the lost tribe, okay, while the rest of the inhabitants of the Americas were mig migrants from Asia. So he only accepted one tribe, but all right, so you will see, you can see if one is there, then the rest are also there, and we're going to show you that. Holmes immediately pointed out that this meant that the climax of world history was at hand because the lost tribes were beginning to reappear. Menasseh was asked what was the Jewish view about the lost tribes and their reappearance. Rather than write another letter, Menasseh wrote his most famous work, The Hope of Israel, which appeared in 1650 in Spanish, Latin, Hebrews, and English, and Dutch. The American Indian descended from the ten lost tribes. And, and so it says in the article. So it says, last month's columns catch the basis for the belief that American Indian is descended from the Ten Lost Tribes. One of the foremost proponents of this theory was the Indian trader James Adair, 1709-1783. In 1775, he wrote the history of the Indians, arguably the most significant 19th century work on the southern, eastern, southeastern Indians, in which he presented 23 arguments that prove the North American Aborigines were descended from the Ten Lost Tribes. These are their division in tribes, their worship of Jehovah, their notions of theocracy, their belief in the administration of angels, their language and dialects, their manner of counting time, their prophets and high priests, their festivals, fasts, and religious rites, their daily sacrifice, their ablutions and anointings, their laws of uncleanliness, their abstinence from unclean things, their marriage, divorces, punishments, and adultery, their several punishments, their cities of refuge, their purification and preparatory, preparatory ceremonies, their ornaments, their manner of curing the sick, their burial of the dead, their mourning for the dead, their raising the seed to descend, their change of the names adapted to the circumstances and times, their own traditions, the account of English writers, and the testimonies given by Spaniards and other writers of the primitive inhabitants of Mexico and Peru. Wasn't gonna take it there yet, but there you go, Mexico and Peru. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, so this is the Jewish press dot com. Okay, so we're going to come back to this. It says here, in the Literary Digest, September 21st, 1912, are the Indians of Hebrew origin. William Penn gave the clue to many subsequent biblical scholars in the declaring that he had found in the American Indians the lost tribes of Israel. The superficial resemblance between the two peoples was so striking that he was led to say, when I look at their children, I imagine myself in the Jewish quarter of London. The Reverend J. Wesley Anus says in Science Herald in Boston that as late as 1889, a well-informed representative of the Moshkoki, Moshkoki, Meshek, Meshik, Moshki, Moshkoki tribe, again, remember that word, when questioned concerning the legends of his people, he replied, they are all in the Old Testament. Read them there without the trouble of taking them down from our people. Corroborative of this statement of Dr. W. W. Warren in his History of the Ojibwe Nation that in response to parts of the Bible which he translated for his people, they said, The book must be true, for our ancestors have told us the same stories for generations. The theory here presented is not new. The Jewish encyclopedia, given the substance of it without pronouncing upon its credibility. The writer meets the objection to the theory based on the great distance between the habitations of the two, two people by citing the book of Esdras. They affirm that after the captivity of Hebrews resolved to separate themselves from the heathen and to seek a spot where they might religiously observe the law for the violation of which they had been so severely punished. Accordingly, he reports them to have migrated to a country which was uninhabited and so far distant that they journeyed for a year and a half or even more. This theory is further supported by the writings of the famous Manasseh ben Israel, who tells us that the America and Asia, now separated by Bering Strait, were formerly one continent and that during this early period these Hebrews penetrated to America by land before it separated. Still more conclusive proof is found in comparative study of the language, religion, customs and traditions of the two peoples. Such resemblances as, as these are noted, like the Hebrews, the Indians, when first visited by the Europeans were a very religious people, yet they had entirely escaped the idolatry which was common to almost all ancient peoples. They acknowledged but one God, the Great Spirit, and the name by which he was known was Ale, the old Hebrew name for God. In their dances they were heard to say distinctively, Hallelujah, or praise Jah. They were word, the very word which was used by the Hebrews themselves. They kept annual festivals which resembled those of the Mosaic ritual. They performed morning and evening sacrifices and offered of their first fruits to God. They practiced the rite of circumcision and celebrated a feast like the tabernacles. They had cities of refuge to which even a murderer might flee and be safe. The Indians reckoned time in the same manner as the Hebrews, and their year began at the same season. The same superstitions seemed to have marked their burial places. The same creeds were the rule of their lives, both as to the present and the future. The Indians, as well as the ancient Hebrews, lived in tribes ruled by chiefs and their forms of government were almost identical. The clan system of the Indians has preserved a clue to some of the mysterious rites of the early Hebrews. What is not known about the clan system of the Iroquois explains what was formerly mystical about the tribes of Israel. Each tribe had a totem, usually some animal such as a deer, a bear, or a panther. So also had Israel as such a totem, and this explains why in the blessings of Jacob upon his sons, Judah is surnamed a lion, Dan a serpent, Benjamin a wolf, Joseph a bull. Literary Digest, September 21st, 1912. Let's hear BreakingIsraelNews.com. Are Native Americans part of the Ten Lost Tribes? When Europeans first glimpsed Native Americans more than 400 years ago, many were convinced they had discovered the lost tribes of Israel. At closer look, the connections are astounding. This hidden association has taken on great importance recently as the two nations face similar threats. 
and perhaps even a common messianic vision quest. The unmistakable traces of Jewish prayer echo in the voice of Joseph Riverwin, the Amahura war chief of the Northern Arawak Nation, the indigenous peoples of South America and the Caribbean, as as he sings "Shema Shema Na Yena Popaska Hoya Ya." He translated his ancient Native American song for breaking Israel news. Listen, listen, people, as you gather together, we will dance before the Creator. This is strongly reminiscent of the Jewish prayer Shema which literally means here. And he says, Among my people our ancient name for God is Jah Jah, the Supreme Spirit of Spirits, very similar to Jahweh. Chief Riverwind explained, Among my wife's ancestors, the Anikituwaya, the Cherokee, they called God Jehohewa, Jehohewa. The similarities don't stop there. They carried an ark into battle, celebrate seven feasts, kept a seventh day of rest, had cities of refuge, and don't eat pork. Though the eerie etymological similarities may be coincidental, ar archetypal themes also connect the spirituality of Native Americans to the Bible. Chief Irwin told the Chakta story about how the Creator came to a man called Nua and told him the world would be covered with water. The man was told to make a great raft to save mankind. The stories come from oral tradition which date to pre-Columbian times. So there's another Native American story it tells of a time when the world was all one landmass and we were all one tribe, explained Chief Riverwind. We tried to build a sky tower to the Creator, hence Babel. Right, the story of Babel? These are the pre-missionary oral traditions. They are passed down through specifically trained story, specially trained storytellers who are forbidden from changing a single word. And he continues saying, Some Anishinaabe Chippewa believe they are from the tribe of Ephraim. Chief Riverwind explains Anish, Anishinaabe is amazing similar to the Hebrew word Anshinaabe, people of the prophet. They lived on the coast, but their legends say that before that they came from across the great waters. We have cave drawings of these ships that are very similar to drawings of Phoenician ships in history books. Again, Phoenician connecting with the Hebrew, right? The Paleo Hebrew, the Phoenicians, the Meshachs, right? The Aztecs. Okay, so it says Jew, the Juniverse.com. More Jewish prominent sites here, okay? Native Americans, the Lost Tribe. Looking at Jews and Native Americans side by side, you might think there's no way to mix up the two cultures. Jarmulkis and eagle feathered headdresses look quite different, right? But some early colonial Americans thought upon discovering the early inhabitants of the Americas that they were the chosen people, perhaps one or more of the lost tribes. Early American writings argued that different Native American languages unfamiliar to European ears were slight variations on Hebrew. And when some white settlers discovered what they thought was a set of Tefal in an Indian town in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in the early 1800s, they used this incident to further support their claim. By linking America's earliest inhabitants with the Bible and its theology, these idealistic colonists suggested the America was indeed the new promised land. So at the time, Jews in colonial America took the Lost Tribes claim very seriously and they reacted in sermons, plays, publics, statements, scholarly works and popular writings. Why was it such a big deal to them? And what were the social ram ram ramifications? The interactions between Jews and Native Americans make for a great story that few remember anymore. Okay, so more corroborating information. They're even saying, what, you know, they're telling you these people really, you know, they were living with them, so they knew what they were seeing and what kind of uh, people they were dealing with. You know, they reminded them of the Jews in Europe. It says here in Wikipedia, the ten lost tribes were the ten of the twelve tribes of the ancient Israel that were said to have been deported from the kingdom of Israel after its conquest by the Neo-Assyrian Empire, circa 722 BC. These are the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, and Joseph. Claims of descent from the lost tribes have been proposed in relation to many groups and some religious oppose a messianic view that the tribes will return. 
It says here, the 12 tribes, uh, scriptural basis for the idea of the 10 lost tribes is 2 Kings 17, 6. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gosan, on the harbor river, in, in the towns of the Medes. According to the Hebrew Bible, Jacob, who was later named Israel, Genesis 35.10, had 12 sons, at least one daughter, Dina, by two wives and two concubines. The 12 sons fathered the 12 tribes of Israel. You see there were some different moms. So that's different kinds of tribes and different people, right? Different families. It says here, the Mormon scripture in the lost tribes of Israel. When the Mormons first emerged in 1830s America, Constantine Samuel Raffinisque, a Christian polymath of French-German heritage, attacked them for their singular but absurd opinion that the American tribes are descended from the Hebrews or the Ten Lost Tribes. Atlantic Journal, Friend of Knowledge, Volume 1, 1833. Strange as it sounds today, such notions of ancestry were widespread among British and American Christians of the time. So, why you think at the time people were saying that? Because they were there amongst the people living with them. They were seeing who these people were. I have this uh, PDF here, the Jewish Advocate, February 27, 2015, says, Pitfield Jewish life on the western frontier of Massachusetts. Perhaps the earliest reference to a Jew in Pittsfield was way back in 1815 when it was reported that a boy clearing an employer's uh, Joseph Merrick's Fort Hill yard of rubbish dug up a set of Teflon. And soon press coverage about the find caused quite a stir across the country, and clergy and scholars flocked to Pittsfield to examine the parchment scrolls enclosed in their leather boxes. At the time, many people believed that the Native Americans were descendants from the lost tribes of Israel and they were convinced that the Teflon had been dropped by an ancient Israelite who perhaps had traveled across the Bering Strait or by boat across the Atlantic. It says in an article with the Agatha Christie ish titled The Case of the Missing Phylactery by William Goetzman reports that the Teflon were donated to the American Antiquarium Society in Worcester on condition that the scholars there publish an article about them. The society failed to produce one so the Teflon were sent to New Jersey scholar Elias Bodinot. Upon Bodinot's death, his heirs donated his papers to Yale University. Yale, skull and bones, once again, skull and bones. If you don't know, research it. Yale University. But the Teflon were not among them, so it got lost. Great, in Yale University. They have not been uh, seen since. Okay, so you, there you go again. Just like what the Smithsonian does. And it says, continuing with Bodinat, while Bodinat and Crawford and other millenarians, people who believed that the uh, end of the world was coming during that time, saw the Indians as the lost tribes. New evidence emerged. The two new theories were offered, in one that of the leading Jewish spokesman, Mordecai Noah, the other by the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. The new evidence were some artifacts that were discovered. One phylacteries that were found in Indian burial mound in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Another a Hebrew inscription outside New Mil Milford, Connecticut. The third a Hebrew tomb in Ohio added to the alleged resemblances that the Lord Kingsborough thought he had found in the Aztec codices to ancient Hebrew motifs. Lord Kingsborough published nine folio volumes of the codices, magnificently illustrated with copious notes from Menace, Adair, and others, to prove the Indians, especially those of Central America, were Jews. Although he bankrupted himself in the process of publishing the material, he convinced only the already convinced and became a laughing stock to others. The Hebrew inscription in New Milford was examined by America's greatest Christian Hebraist, Ezra Stiles president of jail, okay, jail University, again, who guessed it was somebody's name. No one in the area could be found who was Jewish or who knew Hebrew. So a, suggest so a suggestive mystery remained. The phylacteries were a more exciting find. When it was realized that these are used by a Jew in his morning prayers, the physical object was found around 1820, halfway down a pile of Indian bones in a burial mound. Because of the Hebrew letters contained in the object, Christian scholars from Harvard were consulted who identified the object for what it was. But how did it get to where it was found? 
an intensive investigation was carried out to find out if any Jewish traders had been in Pittsfield, if any captured British soldiers had held there were Jewish, with negative results. The great Jewish convert, the Reverend Joseph Frey, who gave 30,000 sermons in America, said he had never spoken in Pittsfield, and the phylacteries were not his. Says the literature of the period indicates that this discovery was taken very seriously as pointing to the possibility that the Indians were Jewish. No other explanation could be found for the phy phylacteries being where they were found. The item was deposited with the Massachusetts Historical Society for further study. By now, when some of us would like to see what was discovered, however, the item has been lost. Here we go again. The item was lost. Like everything else that doesn't fit into history. Pay attention, people, man. They, they hide things intentionally. The late Rabbi Arthur Chill, who wrote an article on the matter and turned up a lot of literature, some rather incredible, in the period of 1820 to 1825, on the subject, also found that the phylacteries had been in the Antiquarian Society of Worcester, Massachusetts, but that they had disappeared. So it says here again, the Mormons, uh, the Mormon movement has been described as the first real indigenous American religion building on the biblical tradition and the American situation. It claimed that new re revelatory material that showed that some of the ancient Jews went to the America instead of Babylon at the time of the destruction of the first temple, that Jesus preached to them in America, and that they, the later day saints, were the bearers of the Christianity and would lead them into the millennium. The Mormon claim is not that not that all Indian are Jews, but that a remnant of the ancient Hebrews exists in America and will join with the followers of Joseph Smith. And it says here, a curious incident that drew considerable attention and proved, at least to some, that Native Americans had ancient Israelite origins unfolded when a Tefillin, a uh, phylacteries, were discovered in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in the early 19th century. Their discoverer wrote that this forms another link in the evidence by which our Indians are identified with the ancient Jews who were scattered upon the face of the globe and to this day remain a living monument to verify and establish the eternal truth of scripture. Another uh, prominent Jew who talks about the natives in the Hebrew connection is uh, Mordecai Manuel Noah. Uh, one of Noah's writings on Jewish natives came to their full expression with his discourse on the evidences of the American Indians being the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, 1837. The work documented a host of theological, linguistic, ritual, dietary, and political parallels between Jews and Native Americans. Most importantly, he identified several essential character traits shared by the two peoples, all of which were, of course, highly laudable for Noah. The conflation of Indians and Jews sanctioned the later as divinely ordained Americans.